We're going to continue in the series. Last week was Jesus is the way. And uh, we, we, went right for, we went right for the point when we started out and just said, is Jesus, that is the way. Jesus, the person, not the teachings, not the trappings, not the bits and pieces that flow out of Jesus, but it's Jesus. And as it says in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And uh, last week we had a picture with a, uh, a stone wall and a gate, a door, if you will. And that door is Jesus Christ. We cannot get to God through his teachings. We can separate his teachings from Jesus. We can't get to God through religion. We can separate religion from Jesus. We can see Jesus as the progenitor or the giver, if you will, of our religion and of our teachings and all of that. But if the teachings and the trappings of Jesus are not the way, but it is Jesus the person, it creates an entirely different scenario. For it no longer then relies upon your response to the teaching of Jesus. It no longer lies upon your acceptance of the, of the religion of Jesus. But it relies on whether you have a relationship with Jesus. And that, my friends, is a whole different ballgame. To demonstrate that, we are looking at the next portion of his testimony that he is not only the way but he is the truth let's take a look in romans chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 in romans chapter 2 paul spends time explaining to the people with a very solid argument that if they were to attempt to live a righteous life according to the law, that attempt would ultimately fail. That even with the good law of God, the solid law of God, they would fall flat. As he says in chapter 2, those of you who teach others not to commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Those of you who teach others, do you do the same thing? And the point of it is not to catch people in some kind of a snarky trap. The point of it is to point out a very real truth. That even though you and I may teach the law, may preach the law, and may even attempt to live the law righteously, there is a point in a which... A point at which we will realize, in spite of our best efforts, we are unable to keep the law. And the law is summed up for Paul in the ritual of circumcision. And so when he says circumcision here, um, he is not just merely talking about the operation that is performed on, on male children uh, in order to remind them that they belong to God, but he is talking about the whole law when he says this, what advantage then is there being a Jew or what value in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very word of God. And what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human being or every man a liar. As it is written, so that you may be proved right when you speak and prevail when you judge. But if our unrighteousness brings out God's righteousness more clearly, what shall we say? That God is unjust? 
in bringing his wrath on us? <clears throat> I am using a human argument. Certainly not. If that were so, how could God judge the world? Someone might argue, if my falsehood enhances God's faithfulness and so increases his glory, why am I still condemned as a sinner? Well, then why not say as some slanderously claim that we say, let us do evil so that good may result. Their condemnation is just. The scripture speaks of the handling, not just of the truth, but of Jesus himself. In the handling of Jesus, we see that the law and circumcision fall short of the glory of God, who is Jesus Christ. The person, the personality, but not just the trappings and not just a philosophy of who Jesus was. Or even of what he taught, for that matter. The law and circumcision fall short because they are not Christ. They are things that came from Christ. Christ, according to the scripture, Christ gave the law. He was in the law. Now, it doesn't say Jesus in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament and in the prophets of the old. It points to Christ as having been present all along in the book of John in the first chapter, first verse. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Nothing was made that was not made through Him. And so we see even at the very outset of the Gospel of John that John testifies that it is indeed New Testament theology, which is based upon Old Testament theology, flows out of it. That Jesus was always present. So Jesus gave the law. The voice it was said when he spoke it to the people where all the people could hear it audibly. It is said his voice was like a trumpet blast. And a, giant, and a great wind accompanied it. At the same time. I've often heard people refer to the story of Elijah when he is in the cave and there's a storm and there's an earthquake and then there's a still small voice and they talk about it as if every time god's ever spoken it's been in a still small voice it's not true <laughs> his voice is like a trumpet blast both at sinai and at patmos where john witnesses of it as he's walking on the beach on the prison island that he writes Revelation from. And so we see in both cases the same voice. The same voice, the trumpet blast. The same voice sounds like the rushing of mighty waters. Also in Revelation, also in the prophets. Jesus is present. He gives the law. He gives the command for circumcision. But the law and circumcision fall short because it is the person of Jesus that the Bible is trying to connect us with. Not the, not the words that proceed out of his mouth. Take a look at, at these true facts. The law is true. But it's not sufficient to save. When we read Jesus is the truth. Our minds, our brains shift away from the person and shift on to what he has taught. And his teachings, the law, it all is true. And if you do what he teaches, <clears throat> you will be wise to do what he teaches. But it falls short of the source of truth. You know, which is better? To own the product that comes from the factory or to own the factory that sells the product? 
You know in financial terms, albeit that's fairly pedestrian compared to what we're talking about this morning, but you know though that in financial terms, it would be better to own the factory. So also, which is better? To follow the teachings of Christ or to have the spirit of Christ within you? <clears throat> Jesus is moving for the latter, not the former. For he wishes to dwell in you, not outside of you, not beside you, not whispering in your ear, but dwelling, actually dwelling inside of you by the virtue and the power of the Holy Spirit. Depravity is also true, but it's not reformable. If you were to grasp the doctrine of total depravity, which is biblical through and through, that you are incapable. If I was to give you this Bible and you were to read it thoroughly and to do everything written in the scripture, but you were not to be transformed, the sinful nature being dismissed, and the new nature of heaven being received, if you were not to experience that transformation, that conversion, you would remain totally depraved. There is only one way for you to be able to do what God wills, and that is a change of nature. The nature of Jesus Christ must inhabit you. Otherwise, you are absolutely incapable of doing what God requires. For the scripture says, without holiness, no man may see the Lord. And even a smidge of depravity, if there was ever such a possibility, there isn't. You're either depraved or you're holy. You're not a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. It doesn't work that way. Depravity is one world and holiness is another world. You have to be completely changed, transformed, converted as the scripture says. And the gospel of depravity is true. And if you were to grasp that completely, but it never changes the way that you look at the world, the way that you approach the world, if it never changes your prayer life, if it never changes your religious life, then it's, it's pointless that you know that it's true because you can't reform depravity. You can only reorganize it. You can't reform it. Next, how can truth set you free? Let's take a look at this. John chapter eight, the gospel of John, of course. Chapter eight. And we read in verses 31 and 32, First of all, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, this, my friends, has been applied on TV shows. It has been applied in uh, stage plays in a very sarcastic and a very amusing way in some cases to try and throw dirt on the idea that the truth will set you free. Now, I will say to you this, there are certain things about me that are true. There are certain things about me that are kind of true. There are certain things about me other people believe to be true and there are certain things about me God knows to be true. So which truth will set me free? Well, you say, well, the truth that God knows about you. No, doesn't set me free. It might drive me to my knees in tears. It might cause me to weep upon my pillow at night to know what God sees in me, but it will not set me free. God is true, but Jesus is truth, the person of Jesus. 
For it says just shortly after this, in verses 34 to 36, Jesus replied, Verily, verily, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the same context. If it is the truth that sets you free and the son that sets you free, the son and the truth must be the same. Therefore, the same person, therefore, Jesus. In other words, Jesus is truth personified. Now, you say, okay, great, big deal. Who cares? There's some implications about this, though, folks. If truth is a person, it can set you free. A person can set you free. Not a belief. If I'm sitting in a POW prison, I can sit there and I can close my eyes and just say, I'm home and I'm sitting at the table and my mother is making me a pie and things are great and I'm fine and I believe it, I believe it, I believe it, I believe it, it's true, it's true. Is that gonna change at all my condition? Am I not gonna open my eyes and still be in prison? But what if somebody comes walking down the hallway, keys are jingling, somebody's gonna be let free, somebody's gonna be let loose. And they open my door and they put me on a plane and they send me home. Has not that person actually set me free? Or perhaps a group of people, a committee of people? So also, you are slave to sin. According to the scripture, Jesus just said this, anyone who sins is a slave to sin, which means somebody has to set you free from sin. Now, if he says the truth will set you free, the truth is you're a slave. That has not set you free. But he says in the same context, if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. So then we see within the context of the scripture that it is the truth synonymous with the son But not, but not allegorically to the Son. Literally, Jesus, the person, if he is everything that God has said he is, and why should we even doubt God, then it is Jesus that will set you free, the person. Not the philosophy, not the teachings, not the trappings. Here are the implications of it. First of all, all true things come from Christ, everything else is a lie. Romans 3, 4, let God be true, let every man be a liar. I know that the, the uh, 2011 NIV renders it human being, they're trying to be inclusive, they're trying to not use language that makes one gender feel excluded from the scripture. And you may say, well, that's really nice. The Bible is not ours to manipulate. It's not ours to manipulate. If God wants to refer to mankind as man, that's his business. It's not up for us to say, oh, well, the way God put it, why that was really kind of not inclusive. We don't have the right to manipulate the scripture. Okay, I object to that. I don't object to it because I'm a man. I object to it because it's scripture and it should not be manipulated. Okay, so I object. Do with it what you will, but I object. All true things come from Christ. Everything else is a lie. That means 
that if you are relying on your understanding of the teachings of Christ, you could be mixing your depravity in with his truth and thereby receiving it in a way it was not intended to be delivered. It's just the way that it is. You've played telephone before, right? Go around the room, say a phrase to each other. You know, you start out with grapes are really good and you get to the end of it and it says my feet smell really bad. You have no idea how we went from grapes tasting good to feet smelling bad, but somewhere along the line, basing everything on the last person that spoke to them, they wind up with some completely different message than what was originally intended. It's the same thing here. Jesus can tell you all he wants. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I speak it even now. I quote it even now. And there are at least probably 50 different interpretations of what that means, or nuances, or connotations existing within this congregation already, solely because we try to grasp that based upon our own understanding. And yet the scripture says, lean not unto your own understanding. And we say, yeah, but except for in this case, or except for in that case. No, the Bible is not ours to manipulate. And you say, well, how can a man avoid manipulating the scripture? One way and one way only. You must have the spirit of Christ dwelling within you. You must acknowledge your depravity you must acknowledge the true things that have been said, but you must acknowledge the source of that truth, Jesus Christ, or you will have nowhere to go but your own understanding. And the Bible has told us not to lean on it, and it has told us that if we trust in man, trust in the arm of flesh for our strength, we will be cursed. Until you are in Christ, your religion is a lie. This is the other, other implication. Until you are actually in Christ, your religion is a lie. How many people we know out there that have variations on the theme of religion, on the theme of Christian religion? <laughs> it's, there, there are as many variations on the theme as there are sands on the shore. And you say, well, Pastor Buddy, how do you know that what you're preaching is the right thing? I have the Spirit of Christ. I rely on the Spirit of Christ. I don't just study the Bible and then come up with my best idea of what it means. The Spirit of Christ dwells in me. You say, well, that's awfully boastful of you. It's factual. If I could take you down through my life and I could show you all of the times when I was a preacher, all the times when I was a Christian, and, and the Spirit of Christ was not operating in me. The Spirit of the flesh was operating in me. And I could show you the, the, the many horrible sermons I preached. And I could show you the, the many gaffes and the many the foibles and the many flubs. And, and all of the times that I did what I thought was right and it turned out to be a mess. If I could show you the three little churches I tried to save and they all closed behind me. You would say to yourself, whoa, there really is something different at work in you today than there used to be. Yeah, there is. And you say, well, didn't you always have the spirit of Christ? He was always there since the time that I was saved but I was never taught the difference between living by the flesh and living by the spirit. I was never taught the doctrine of total depravity. I was never given the instruction I needed. And in 1998, God laid it on my heart. He spoke to my heart and he said, if you will let me teach you, I will teach you. And I said, fine, great, do it. I said, I'm dying to know what the scripture says. I'm dying to make sense of it. You say, 1998, you became a pastor in 88. Yeah. 
10 years of batting at the wind and hoping that I hit something right. It was hard on me. I wanted to be a good Christian. I remember standing in one of those little churches and calling out to the Lord, God, why did you bring me here just to watch this place close? Help me, help me. I don't know what I'm doing. This church needs a leader and I'm not suited for this. You say, boy, I hope you didn't say that here. No, I haven't said that here. <laughs> We're, it's, it, it's, it's, not, it's not like that here. And it's not like that in my life. Believe me, God, God has spent years disappointing me on purpose. Ruining me on purpose. So that only together with you in this day could I stand before you and confidently say, I have the spirit of Christ. I could never have said that prior to coming here. I could have said the spirit of Christ was with me, but I was living by the flesh. I was doing the best I could with my own understanding, not realizing I was totally depraved and I should not have been relying upon that. Did people get saved during my ministry before? Yeah, there were some people that got saved, probably in spite of me, but they still got saved. Weren't you a good counselor? Sure, I was a good counselor. I always listened to people and I was always good at what I did. I've always been good at preaching. I've always been good at being a pastor. I've always been good at all of this, but listen folks, that's not the same as operating as a servant of God. I was operating as God's pal, operating as God's assistant, operating as God's sidekick, but not operating as his servant. And that makes all the difference. The implications here are that you and I must have the spirit of Christ. Anything less than that. And we are living out a lie. Let's pray. God, we don't come before you lightly. We have been given information that perhaps has set someone's heart off of the foundation upon which it had been standing. And now they need to know what foundation are they supposed to build on. You say, Lord, we should build upon the foundation of your teaching. And yet, Lord, you also say that true discipleship has to happen after we get saved. God, help us. For we need you more than ever before. Amen.